Okay, now we're going to talk in the next 40 minutes about the other 350 species of organisms <laughs> of fungi. Uh, these are infections due to fungi of low virulence in patients who are immunologically compromised. And no matter if I gave you a list, it'll be outdated next month when another report comes out. All at the bottom of the iceberg, I, I just kind of relax on this, okay? Just get an idea of what's going on. Uh, I don't think there are any questions that really come out of this area, except maybe opportunity, what are opportunistic fungi. Uh, we, uh, we discussed uh, the systemics. We didn't discuss 25 species, but remember uh, some of the uh, chromo, uh, subcutaneous mycoses and chromomycosis, I said, here are the three most common, and aspergillus, these are the most common. But in total, we probably about 25. The cutaneous pathogens, those are the dermatophytes we talked about. Uh, again, we just talked about them in categories of genera. And subcutaneous pathogens, okay, and there's the other 300. If any of you taken basic uh, microbiology, pathogenic bacteriology, or, well, if you did, okay, Th this was a basis. Right? Do you remember this? That the number of organisms times virulence, depending on the host resistance, then you have disease. Host resistance is lowered, or the number of organisms are increased, or the virulence is increased, and that's how you get disease. Uh, the opportunistic fungi are saprophytic or endogenous. By endogenous, we mean they're already inside the body. Typical examples are we all have some Canada in us, and we all probably have some actinomyces in us, endogenous organisms that become, you, you've, um, you change that, uh, you, you change either the host resistance, the number of organisms, without even changing the virulence, and you get infection. They're just to indicate that there are a lot of them. Now, these are the most frequent. And these are the most serious. Uh, if you're in private practice, but at this point, you're, you're probably, with a compromised patient, you're probably going to be having an infectious disease consult. If you go into infectious diseases, I pity you, because it's, it's very complicated, mind-boggling the way they, I've been telling you like one drug for this in, in general. Well, they'll use three or four, and it depends on so many various factors of when they use them all. And this all has occurred just in the last 10 years, this, this change. But remember, this is important. These three are your primary opportunistic infections. And most of these infections occur in hospital. Uh, we have increased clinical awareness by physicians, particularly infectious disease people. Uh, the diagnostic tools are so, you know, you didn't go after a biopsy of a lung before because you had to open up the chest, and that was probably worse than the disease. Now they go in with a scope and pull out a little chunk and send it to the lab. It's, uh, so th that, that's helped tremendously in making these diagnoses. Uh, the labs are getting into molecular techniques. I neglected to mention this, but we're using uh, molecular techniques to identify blastomycosis, histoplasmosis, and coccidioidomycosis. And instead of doing this conversion from one form, that's what we had to do. They had yeast into a mycelium and a mycelium into yeast to prove it, and that would take a couple of weeks. Uh, they can do it in a couple of hours. They're very expensive, though, but they can do it when these improved laboratory diagnostic techniques. Of course, the increased susceptibles whether it's HIV infection or with our uh, chemotherapies for different ca cancers, radiation therapies, all these are increasing the susceptible hosts. And the invasive diagnostic procedures and therapeutic procedures, sticking hoses in every orifice or non-orifice or making a new orifice and sticking instruments or catheters in there. Now, you remember I discussed in the first hour, colonization means the organism is there, but it's not causing any disease. Transient fungemia means that you 
sometimes got that this was noted a long time what uh, uh, particularly streptococcus and bacteria. When a person had a tooth extraction, they would have some organisms in the bloodstream for a while. Normal host would just take care of them, and they're gone in a couple of weeks. Okay, that's a transient, and in this case, it'd be fungemia when we're talking about fungi. And the third is actual infection that needs therapy. Colonization, they're just growing there. Remember, I showed you these before. An infection, they're actually invading the tissue. Um, this is going to be depend on you. You're going to, uh, particularly if you go into family practice, you're going to be the first online to see these. And you've got to think and direct the patient to whatever specialist or call in whichever specialist you think you need if you're in a general practice. Uh, the problem here now is because everything I taught you before is different in these diseases. You have atypical signs or symptoms, but not the usual. The etiologic agent may be a saprophyte, so, okay, hey, this wasn't on the list. This is not a pathogen. Well, it is for this patient. And they may be outside these endemic areas we talked about. One old professor used to say, there is, for a compromised host, there is no such thing as a, a non-pathogenic fungus, or for that matter, bacteria either. Uh, the predisposing factors mostly, again, I'm not going to ask you to remember all these things, but just to have these ideas in the back of your head. Leukemias, lymphomas, and Hodgkin's disease, the malignancies that uh, make these people susceptible to fungus infection. Drug therapies like antineoplastics, steroids, and immunosuppressive drugs all make the host uh, compromised and they get infected. Overuse of antibiotics are inappropriate. This is, you know, I learned this 50 years ago when I was a medical student, and it's still prominent today, uh, particularly if you go into pediatrics, although pediatricians are starting to get a backbone now. The mamas want you to give the kid a shot of something, and they get antibiotics, and that's what causes, that's what's caused antibiotic-resistant organisms. Infectious disease people are preaching this every day. Uh, because they alter the normal flora. And what you particularly see this, and this is not always improper medicine, females will get uh, your, your urinary tract infections. They get treated with an antibiotic, and then the yeast will take over and they get vaginal candidiasis. Now, in that case, that's not oversight because that's about the only therapy you can do. More predisposing factors, therapeutic procedures. Again, the infectious disease with a solid organ transplant or a bone marrow transplant or open heart surgery, you get um, different organisms, that different fungi that usually infect, and they'll go through a whole different scale of which is the drug of choice, whether it's this, this, or that, or whatever the predisposing condition is. I don't know how you, you can ask Dr. Brian next week when he comes how to make all these decisions. Indwelling catheters, artificial heart valves, radiation therapy. When I was, uh, I did infectious disease internship, and uh, all we knew was if you had indwelling catheters, they had to be removed. You never go to cure the patient. Even at that time, that was the early days of uh, heart valves, the heart valve had to be removed and replaced before you can cure the infection. I'll talk to you a little more about that later on, because now we're finding out why. We didn't know it then. And then these are other factors. And with each of these diseases and things, you have a different group of organisms that are most likely. Uh, this is our biggest factor, although it's changing now. Mycology, one of the big things that increased fungus infections, uh, up till about three or four years ago were the AIDS patients, but now they're getting good control with some of these um, HIV drugs that we're seeing drop off in fungal infections. I would say the last three or four years, maybe. Uh, HIV de destroys the CD4 helper T cells, which is your most likely uh, 
your defense. And uh, so, therefore, almost all AIDS patients will come down with infection. Excuse me. <coughs> now, this is important. Biofilms. I said ignore everything, but I think you should know biofilms. And you'll probably get this somewhere along in your... Because <coughs> this, this is new. By new, I mean five, eight, ten years in medicine. A polysaccharide slime, which is a micro colony with channels to bring in nutrients and carry off waste. That's a lot of words. Let me show you. See this stream? That's almost in my backyard. What, what happens when you reach in, you go up here to Smoky Mountains and you reach in the water and uh, touch the rocks? How does it feel besides cold? Slimy. Okay, that's where the slimes are. What happens here, here's a cell wall, okay? And these white things are your invading yeast or whatever, or bacteria too. Okay, these are antibodies, and the antibodies clop on them, get rid of them. The macrophages eat them up, okay? Now what happens, they form, this is uh, a biofilm. Those dark forms, they're, they're a vegetative form, but they're sealed off. And the antibodies can't get at them. The macrophages can't get at them. And they grow bigger and bigger, and then they go back and shed the yeast or the bacteria and shed them out. See? But meanwhile, macrophages can't get at them. So that's why these biofilms were being formed on the intravenous catheter or on the uh, heart valve or anything artificial in the patient. And that's why you couldn't cure them. You give them an antibiotic, and all it does is kill off all these loose ones, and these pop out again out of the biofilm. And this was a case before biofilms were realized uh, of uh, Malassezia furfur. You remember harmless skin disease, 25% of the people, spaghetti and meatballs? This was an indwelling catheter, and they reported this unusual phenomenon uh, of the organism. That's all organism, in, inside the catheter and on the needle. It was a biofilm. Uh, and you know where biofilms were first discovered? Water pipes. In the um, public health labs, we have to deal with water supply and this sort of thing. And I had heard about, uh, oh, 15 years ago of these uh, biofilms formed in water pipes. So they came a very difficult time when they had an outbreak of disease to disinfect them because they knew about biofilms, yeah. Right. Not, not really a capsule, but this slime. It's not actually a con And they get nutrients in and out. Remember the definition said channels for nutrients? They get nutrients and excrete, so they stay viable. And then they get come out again. They don't know exactly why they come out at this point, but at least we're getting way ahead of the game from where we were a while back. Uh, these are some of the problems you're going to have. The signs are atypical, like pulmonary sporotrichosis. Ten years ago, nobody would have thought, well, 20 years ago, nobody would have thought about it. Unusual organ affinity. I told you where these, uh, uh, there's an affinity. Blastomycosis goes to the bone and prostate. Well, you're going to find it somewhere else. Outside the endemic area, unusual histopathology and unusual pathogens. Okay, let's discuss this a little bit. I told you about Malassezia furfur. Senior versicolor, very mild disease. Here's a nice picture. Showed up better than the one I showed you the first day, doesn't it? Um, even though it looks bad, it's very mild. I mean, the most you'll get is a slight itch. It's a cosmetic problem, really. Uh, spaghetti and meatballs, so we know what it is. And now we know it can cause disseminated infection. That was the needle, the intravenous catheter I showed you. It covered up. Uh, again, what we have here is compromise. Uh, it's a uh, decrease. It's a low virulence organism, 
and the host resistance dis de decreased, so you get uh, disease. Uh, Canada, Albicans, endogenous, harmless in most people. That's normal flora. What's normal flora? Those organisms that are in the normal body anytime in the absence of disease. But, and this is you and me, hopefully, we have plenty of organisms, we have good host resistance, we don't have disease. But the compromised patient, the host resistance is down, so we get disease. This is Canada alpacans of the mouth. Isn't that horrible looking? And this is uh, something they discovered early on in the uh, AIDS epidemic uh, in the early 90s, that the normal host would get oral candidiasis, dentists would detect this frequently, and you cure it, and it's over with. But compromised individuals get Canada of the esophagus. So that was something infectious disease people were always watching out for. Uh, hepatic candidiasis unheard of before. That's a liver. This is the opening of the body and the liver is reflected back, so you're looking at the bottom of the liver. See all those abscesses? They're kind of albicans. So that's what's an unusual organ affected. You remember cryptococcus associated with pigeons, uh, mostly as meningitis. Now we're a little seeing a little more pulmonary disease and skin disease. Pigeon droppings and chicken droppings. Inhalation and inoculation. That's cryptococcus in a compromised patient. We didn't used to see that kind of thing. And they are cryptococci. This doesn't show the capsules well. Uh, I don't remember what the background was here, but they're rather large yeast. Pulmonary crypto. That's another crypto lesion. Uh, this, here's crypto in a giant cell. The darker reddish sort of are the cryptococci here. Now, what tissue is that? Heart. Very good. Okay, heart tissue. Cryptococci in heart. This was a patient in Central America. I never heard of that before. And you can see the capsule staining in this very well. Cryptococcus has a capsule, CC, Cryptococcus CNS capsule, CCC. Again, I told you all these people excavating manure out of these uh, pigeon droppings out of these old buildings in the old Columbia Hospital when they tore that down. Nobody infected. They were uh, low number. They are highly virulent because the, when we put them in animals, the isolates from the pigeon droppings would cause disease in animals. But a normal host, and they wouldn't get disease. Okay. But you compromise the host and you get an infection. Cryptococcus primary is amphotericin B followed by 5-FC. But for the compromised patient, AIDS patients are on fluconazole the rest of their life. It's big bucks. I think I have a, because fluconazole is one of the few drugs that does penetrate into the spinal fluid. I thought I had a dollar sign on one of these. Uh, in a non-AIDS, the relapse rate, non-AIDS patient, 15 to 20 percent will relapse. In the AIDS patients, 50 percent relapse. And then when they relapse, there's 60 percent mortality, even with these high-powered antimycotic drugs. Uh, without treatment, 100% fatal cryptococcosis. With tra treatment, you reduce it to 20%. It's not zero. Sporotrichosis, which we uh, just discussed uh, a little while ago. Primary cutaneous lymph nodes, and recently we're seeing as a pulmonary disease, I've got to reverse those, I guess, because inoculation is your primary portal of entry. Sticking, rose thorns, brush, okay? You remember all that? See, I just showed you that, so you should remember all that. 
Uh, now we're seeing a lot of, uh, I see a cat cytomegala virus by Dr. Ganjemi just recently. Uh, AIDS patients with cytomegala virus infections, cryptococcal meningitis, disseminated sporal trichosis. They're, they're just uh, petri plates. There's a minor sporal. Now, blastomycosis, there aren't a lot of um, blastomycosis in AIDS patients, and I don't know why. There was only one report, and this is back in the late 90s, uh, of 16 patients, but uh, 10 had localized diseases, so seven were lung, like we would expect, two skin, one CNS, as six of them became disseminated. And that, that's, that's a little unusual, and all did very poorly. Uh, when I discussed aspergillus, I told you up in Maryland, in the Baltimore area, they're composting. Aspergillus is an organism of composting. Tremendous number of organisms. Low virulence, normal host. None of those people were infected. However, compromised hosts, even though it's a low number and a low virulence, you get infection. This is a cutaneous lesion of, I had to get this out of some journal that doesn't reproduce real well, but, or it didn't at that time. But nobody ever heard of cutaneous lesions of aspergillus. Now here, this is a baddie. Uh, with amphotericin B, 72% mortality, Without therapy, 90% mortality. We've got a newer drug now that's been licensed three or four years called voriconazole, and I believe that's in your notes, and I believe that's what I mentioned when we discussed it. Voriconazole is doing much better. Of course, we aren't going to know. It's going to take years before we know what relapse rates are. Yeah. What kind of what? Prognosis. To get it in the brain. <laughs> yeah, it, it's possible. I, 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 I can't speak to that specifically. I don't have any experience with that. But what I would you'd have to go in there, and neurosurgeons could do amazing things today, and go in there and drain that lesion, and maybe even instill. They're doing a lot of intrathecal for CNS, particularly. They go right, or they go right into put antibiotics right into the ventricles of the brain, and it would probably take something like that to control it. Okay, outside the endemic area, uh, this patient had disseminated coccidioidomycosis. Remember, southwest spherules and all that desert. Spherules, but this one had full of mycelium, and it was in St. Louis, non-endemic area. They never expect to see a case there. Um, here, this was a, uh, I guess this is the same case. He had pneumocystis pneumonia, disseminated, but not pulmonary coxy, which is mainly, it's a pulmonary disease. Not spherules, my, uh, mycelial forms, and in St. Louis. Here are the spherules, so we know that eventually that it was coccidioidomycosis. These are the mycelial elements. And, and, you know, the only thing we used to see in tissue was this for coccidioidomycosis. Uh, histoplasmosis. This is the most common fungal infection in uh, AIDS patients, is histoplasmosis. Uh, all cases are disseminated. Relapse greater than 50% and rapidly fatal in 10%. Disseminated disease in the AIDS patient, not just pulmonary, and then there are a couple of cases out in New York City which is not in the endemic area. This is an anal lesion, and of course you can't tell that that's histoplasmosis from this. It's not where histoplasmosis is supposed to be. It doesn't look like anything. But this was the biopsy section, and there are the small 5, 6 micron, slightly oval-shaped yeast of histoplasma capsulatum. And here's a uh, 
I think that's a bone marrow cell. And here are all the histoplasma capsulotoms. And you can see why they're called capsulotum. It looks like they have a capsule, but they don't really. Unusual histopathology. Usually, you get a pyogenic and granulomous reaction. That's what we've talked all through these lectures. But in the immunodeficient host, you have necrosis around the organisms. And at A to Z, all the other organisms. Uh, I'm just going to touch on this because uh, we made the first isolation in a human here in South Carolina in somewhere early 70s. And now it's a common infection of uh, compromised patients, particularly AIDS patients. It's mostly in uh, Southeast Asia and in the United States, of course, too. It's usually not a pathogen. It's a penicillium. And penicillium, we didn't discuss those, but they're very much like aspergilli. And they're about 900 species. And the spores and the colors and the shape and the texture to identify them. This one is dimorphic. It has a yeast form. Only one. And it produces a beautiful red pigment. That's a clue. I mean, you see this thing growing out. Really tremendous. There's the red pigment around the edge. This is the penicillium. Remember I said it's similar. But they're a little different than the uh, aspergillus, but those are all the spores. Um, we just came out lousy. Uh, th these are yeast forms. And sometimes it forms this like tubular yeast form. Most of the time, they are small yeast. Oh, here, some. That, and they look like histoplasma capsulatum. They look exactly in the yeast form in tissue like histoplasma capsulatum, unless you spot one of these oblong ones, and then you say, uh-oh, histo doesn't do that. Uh, pneumocystis, no, no, has anyone talking on pneumocystis? Oh, okay, because this was not thought to be a fungus. Only recently now, taxonomically, it looks like it really is a uh, fungus. Uh, so it's kind of pretty much lost. Uh, and these are just some associations. You usually find, again, I don't expect you to remember this, you usually find cryptococcus in these diseases. I think I put a chart in the back of your book, in the back of your, Canada are usually in these diseases. Toriolopsis, which is another Canada species. Remember I told you there are several Canada species, and we only talked about Canada albicans because that's the most common. But you've got to do speciation on these Canada because the drug resistance varies with the Canada species. These ID people really got to be up on a lot of things. Okay, and that goes with these uh, conditions. Oh, that's, that's Toriolopsis. It's a small yeast. It's slightly elliptical, but you can't really tell it from any of the other yeasts just looking at that. The mucors, that's the second. You remember I told you aspergillus and mucor are most common. Canada, aspergillus mucor in compromised patients. Aspergillus species. Now, how are we getting around? Well, we're getting a few newer drugs. I'd say the last, well, we had um, amphotericin B from the 50s on. Then we got um, nystatin, but that's very limited, topical, uh, uh, in late 50s. We didn't get any really new drugs. We started to get ketoconazole, some of the azoles, in late 70s and 80s. But the last 10 years, we've got another, they call them first generation, second generation, one of the third generation azoles now. And uh, th th those are some good drugs. They're all manipulations, though, of the same molecules. Uh, new therapeutic regimens, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Aggressive therapy, meaning getting in there first, preemptive, ahead of time, and conjunctive, and I'll, I'll explain each of these a little bit. Uh, Echinokine candidins, I, I haven't discussed those because they're, they're still new. Don't want to. I hope you just learned some of the basics. Uh, third generation, I mentioned that, azoles, the new, new classes, totally new classes of antifungal agents. Very few, though. 
combination therapy simultaneously administering two drugs sequential therapy you give them some effort terrorism be then from five i see and then you go back to the effort terrorism be to get away from resistance and alternate administration uh... of two or more drugs at the same time uh... aggressive therapy prophylactic now when they know they've got an idea remember i showed you those charts certain patients get certain infections so if they see this coming this patient they may even give them antifungal therapy without evidence of disease. Empirical, if the patient has a fever and an infiltrate, we'll say they're post-op or they radiation, cancer, or whatever, at compromised, compromised patients, and they get antibiotics for a couple of days, bingo, the IDs will hit them with empirically, and that reduced infections tremendously. And uh, preemptive, is when there may be, there's no positive isolation, but you may have serology, or again, the patient fits in one of those categories, and then they start the appropriate therapy. Uh, immunotherapy now is being used experimentally in combination with antifungal agents. Interferon, uh, commonly stimulating factors in interleukins. Uh, we need more molecular. We, we're, mycologists are behind in molecular to understand the fungal genetics, that's starting off now pretty good. Pathogenesis, to describe the epidemiology because you can identify particular strains. So if this patient got infected, you know whether they got it in the hospital, at home, or somewhere, because this is well done in, in uh, uh, micro and bacteriology, particularly food. They can pinpoint exactly, okay, it's salmonella, but they don't want to, they get way beyond to the phage type. And, uh, specifically. And then to select different targets. Right now, almost all the targets are the cell wall formation. And then better serological tests. I told you about percents that are low in uh, sensitivity and the cross reactions with uh, complement fixation. This was what Louis Pasteur said in 1854. In the field of observation, chance only favors those who are prepared. Uh, in other words, you have to be aware and think about these things to call attention. If you don't have something in your background of knowledge, uh, you aren't going to make these diagnoses. And then this is back in 1972. Dr. Ayala was the head of the mycology division at CDC. And we had a conference in uh, 1972 in uh, Lexington, Kentucky, on just on opportunistic infections. Way, way back then, they were becoming a problem. And he said, only the prepared mind can help the impaired host, which I thought was real neat. Okay, that's it. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, question?